In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. This is going to be an odd introduction, but I'm going to do the best that I can to describe myself. If you've ever read the Screw Tape Letters, the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, they're Christian fiction, and it takes a look, and Lewis fully admits that this is just his opinion. Like, it's Christian fiction, which means that Lewis took several, I guess, uh, literary freedoms with the Bible, and he doesn't necessarily portray it as though this is the way that it actually happens. This is just kind of the way that Lewis imagines temptation happening in his own mind. And several parts of it are based on biblical ideas and biblical thought. But uh, a lot of it is is just his own opinion. But it's an opinion that I think makes a lot of sense, and it's internally plausible. And I think that he's probably not too far off the mark in the way that demons tempt human beings. And I do believe, because the Bible says that that is something that, that takes place. I don't think that it happens in the very direct way, for example, demon possession like that happened in the first century. But I do think that demons are still very much a real part of human life and that they really do try to tempt you away from God. And re- part of the reason that I'm saying all this in my introduction right here is because I do think that some of these experiences that are had by people, they don't realize that that's what's going on. I'm not saying that demons make people do anything, and Lewis doesn't suggest that either. I think that uh, when that takes place, um, sort of like a, a friend that has a bad influence on you or something like that, that the demon kind of offers suggestions, but they don't really make you do anything. And that's the way that Lewis portrays it. I think that's a pretty good representation of how it actually happens, and I believe... Can't can't prove it, don't know this for sure, but I believe that's actually something that happened to me recently. In fact, last night I was uh, feeling a temptation very strongly to defy God and, and act in uh, rebellion against his will. And I, I wonder, not sure, but I wonder if there was some kind of influence that was going on that I know that at the very least I was paying attention to the the worst parts of my personality as opposed to the best parts and what God expects of me as a Christian and as a disciple of of his. And one of the things that I uh, considered and immediately realized how ridiculous it was, was whether it was me thinking this or this was a thought that was sort of whispered in my ear, as as Lewis describes it, by uh, some kind of, of dark force that just go ahead because God's never really done anything for you. And immediately after that thought crossed my mind, I started laughing because nothing could be further from the truth. It was so utterly absurd and ridiculous, this idea that God's never really done anything for me, that it immediately snapped me out of that mode of temptation. And so... If that was a dark influence, then they made a fatal error in bringing that thought to my attention. Because if that is what is going on, then there is nothing more absurd from that. In fact, uh, it would be more correct to say that there is nothing that God has not done for me. And I, I take you to one of my favorite chapters in the scripture in Romans 8, 31 through 33, where the, the Roman writer Paul writes... What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for all of us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And especially the the last verse in that reading in verse 32, where it's saying, He who did not spare his own son. And I think that's really the the takeaway line from that passage. Because the way that Paul is presenting this is he's encouraging his brothers there at Rome and saying, 
I, I get it. You guys are facing persecution, and it is rough. And I understand that that is not an easy thing to do. And Paul would have been speaking from experience. I mean, very few people have suffered as much as Paul at the hands of others just for him being a Christian. So Paul, he was not doing this out of apathy or saying, look, I know it's hard. I've not really been there. No, no. Paul knew what persecution felt like. And he understood and understood well that that is exactly what was going on here at Rome. But what he's saying here is, guys, I get it, but if you're on the Lord's side, who's really going to stand against you? Seriously, that's the question that he's posing. Because if God is on your side and he was willing to give his own son to protect you from sin, do you really think he is going to take a step back or maybe just kind of halfway do something to protect you now? Do you really think that God was going to give that ultimate sacrifice? And then when you do start facing temptation, or you do face something that is causing a problem in your spiritual life that God is just going to sort of sit back and let you handle it on your own? Of course not. That's silly. And so, kind of similar to what I was going through last night, and I realize that's nowhere near what the persecution that the early uh, Christians at Rome were going through. I'm not saying that it is. But when you're reminded of the fact that he was willing to give his own son, that there was nothing that God was not willing to do to rescue you from your own sin, it is a very sobering thought that makes you think, yeah, if God was willing to do that, I probably shouldn't have to worry too much about anything that's going to come up against me. Because if he was willing to do that, then he's going to be willing to do pretty much anything else that I need to be able to get to heaven. Now, granted, a lot of that responsibility is on you as well, because God's already offered the gift. It's still your responsibility to take advantage of it. But what I am saying here is that whether it's a temptation or it's something that's going on in your life that's not ideal, like with the persecutions in Rome or you just don't have everything that you think you ought to have, or you're in a really rough situation, you're going through a sickness, or you're dealing with a family member that is, or something like that, whatever it is, God spares no expense when it comes to helping his children. Because when we were lost in our sins, and the only possible way to rescue us was to give up his only begotten son, God still said, fine, I'll pay it. And if he was willing to do that, we really shouldn't have to worry about any other kind of obstacle coming up against us because that was the biggest obstacle of all, the obstacle that would require the most from God to do, and he did it. Which means whatever we're going on in our, whatever's going on in our life that's causing us problems right now, God's able to overcome that. And he's going to help us overcome it because he's already helped us overcome the greatest obstacle of our spiritual lives. And in my case especially, that's very true because I'm sure God has saved all of us in a physical way. In other words, spared our physical lives probably countless times, and we just didn't know it. But in my case, he did so in a very obvious way because of the struggle that I, I went through with cancer and much faster than any of my doctors honestly could explain, I was able to overcome that and overcome it with very little side effects. And so, especially for somebody like me, the idea that God's never really done anything for me is just so patently absurd. Laughter was the only correct response. Because no matter what we're going through in life, God has already done everything for us. Stay the course, friends. Now, I know you're here because you're interested in information on what's going on in the state of Alabama and around the world, and you've come to the right place for that. But it's YouTube, so you could also just be here because you're bored. If you want me to keep making videos to keep you occupied, you need to go ahead and like and subscribe. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back to playing Minesweeper.